A lot has happened since the last video in which you saw me driving my 1982 Lada Neva, extolling its virtues, prepping it to convert to clean, pure, fast electric power. Well, that's changed. You might have noticed. Look at the direction the cars behind me are faced. They are on the correct side of the road. Yeah, I'm back in New Zealand. Short version is, my American wife said I want a divorce. So, I got out and now I'm right back here in New Zealand starting life where I left off. So, the thing is, you'll notice that I'm walking, right? I'm not in a car, I don't have a car. Well, I do have a car, but I'm about to go and pick it up. So, it's going to be my mission over the next few minutes to convince you that the car I've just bought is actually pretty awesome. Now, it's going to, the minute you see it, half of you are going to go, Ugh, and downvote. Other half of you are going to go, what the hell? Okay, so, over the next few minutes, I'm going to try and convince you that this car that I just bought is actually pretty damn awesome. Stick around, bear with me. Here we go. I made my way to the car dealership to pick it up, but which car will it be? Okay, I can see it. So which one is it? Place your bets. Could it be the yellow one on the left? Could it be this brown one on the right? Or could it be further down? I can see it. Could it be this Toyota? No, of course not, that would be as boring as hell. Could it be that Mazda? No, it's not. It is a car that Americans have never heard of. A few minutes later, we did some paperwork and I grabbed the keys, which, as you can see, had Japanese writing all over them. Now that is because this 2012 Daihatsu Mira with Eco Idol, Eric Idol's brother, has come straight off the boat from Japan. It's a JDM, or Japanese Domestic Market car, never intended for export. But as New Zealand drives on the correct side of the road, like Japan, we get loads of their used Japanese cars that the rest of the world never gets to see. Now this meant that I had to go through the car and clean it thoroughly to bring it up to standard so I could finally put my neon white bum on the seats. This meant removing all of these weird Japanese stickers, looking at the quirks like this flare holder for road flares, and taking it apart piece by piece to get to know it. And as you can see it only came with the very bare basics in terms of tyres, jack and stuff. And, again, like many Japanese cars, all the dashboard stuff is in Japanese. Now, it's an automatic. Well, not really. It's a CVT, or constantly variable transmission car, which means it doesn't really have a gear as such. It's got one gear, and it's constantly evolving to find the best torque position for the engine. But first and foremost, I needed to get this thing properly clean, because it was pretty grimy. But before I do that, let me just show you the power plant that is propelling this machine along. It is a 660cc, 38kW, 3-cylinder Japanese engine. And I don't know if it's possible for an engine to be adorable, but this thing does a pretty darn good job. Now something else you should check out is the back seat legroom. I mean, check this out. I'm 5 foot 10, and there is heaps of room. And heaps of head height as well. But yeah, back to cleaning the car. It is grimy and filthy and slimy after being stuck on a wharf for more months. As for cleaning the car, I had to get rid of months of road grime, shipping dust, and confusing Japanese stickers, which meant using loads and loads of window cleaner and raw alcohol. And just occasionally, the stickers came off in one piece, which was a miracle. Okay, this is interesting. I just parked the car and noticed a coin that does not look like a New Zealand coin. What the heck is that? It turns out it's a 10 yen Japanese coin. So I guess that's my gift with purchase. Something interesting about this car is also the paperwork that came with it. The original manual is obviously all in Japanese, because this is a JDM, or Japanese domestic market car, never designed for export. Also came with all this paperwork. 
I have no idea what that is. Maybe something to do with the mission control or leaving the country, I don't know. Uh, but what's also interesting is, apart from that 10 yen coin, is the, where is it? CD that came with this car. Yeah, so that's obviously a Japanese pop song. I better turn that down or YouTube will get all upset that I'm not paying copyright on music. You know what they're like. So yeah, um, that's all very interesting. You've got to have a dash cam. Got all that trim off. The hard part, as always, is to hide cables. A lot of guys just don't mind having cables flailing around on the dashboard. I hate seeing cables. So let's see if I can do my best to hide this monstrosity. Installing the dash cam on the front is the easy part, but the back is the difficult part because Obviously, there's a large gap between the, wind, the bottom of the window, or the top of the window, and the uh, rear of the car. So I want to get the cable somehow to the camera without seeing when you close the lid, there'll be some slack. And I don't want a loop of cam cable in my rear view mirror like that. I did my best to route the cable through the existing channels in the car because I don't know if you're the same, but I can't stand seeing cables. And the end result wasn't too bad. So I've done the best I can under the circumstances. I've used existing adhesive clips that came with it and the rubber grommet and cabling duct system. Uh, there is still a gap there, unfortunately. So I'm gonna jam that full of silicon, uh, silicon glue. And then the cables just run down and I've got them coiled up and zip tied next to the uh, rear seat belt. All that was left was to give the car its first proper soapy wash. It's now all fired up, ready to rock and roll. So, you gonna take it for a drive? Okay, see how it looks. The quality from this Blackview dash cam is pretty good as you can see. And here's where you can see the narrowness of this car allows you to go straight through spaces like that. And as for the rear camera, the definition's also really good, even though it's looking through a tinted glass window. As for the size of the car, once again, check this out. That four wheel drive in front of me, it's just a normal sized four wheel drive. But in Auckland city, you get a lot of situations where the roads are really narrow because of parked cars and he's got to slam his brakes on. But me, I can go straight on through such narrow spaces. But enough about the size of the car, let's take it for an actual drive. It is a hot Auckland day. I'm gonna take you for a test drive in the micro. Or as uh, someone on the internet suggested I call it, the Razor, because of its shape and color and size. Let me put my foot down. And we're at 50. All right. That was as fast as it gets. This is not a car that you're going to win any drag races in. It is built for the city. It has a 660cc, that is cubic centimeters, engine. And it puts out a total of uh, 37 kilowatts, which in horsepower, I actually wrote it down because horsepower is meaningless. Sorry, 38 kilowatts, start again. 51 horsepower, which is almost noteworthy. So, what can I tell you about this car? It is a K-class car, which means it is built to certain dimensions, certain power output, so that it can be classified as a K-car for Japanese consumers. Now, what that means is that these particular cars, these K-class cars, get tax breaks, cheaper insurance, they cost less, so they're really popular in Japan, uh, but you can't get them elsewhere, outside of Japan, because the, there's no market for them. People in America are not gonna buy a car this size. Uh, but one other thing that uh, K-class cars have is a big benefit regarding parking. If you live in Japan, quite often, you need to prove that you have a parking space before they'll let you buy a car. But in many parts of Japan, K-class cars are exempt. So you can see why they've got a lot of incentives for the Japanese people. They are, as you can tell, tiny. Uh, but this one, it's got all the options. Even though it's microscopic and cost me four and a half thousand New Zealand dollars, which is, what, 3,000-ish US dollars, it has air conditioning, mirrors. I've never actually tried to see if they fold in. Oh my god, they fold in! Look at that! They fold back out again, that's the next question. Oh, look at that! Man, we're living in the future. Air conditioning, which is a little weak. Uh, it takes a while to get cold. Um, it has a constantly variable transmission gearbox, which means that it's constantly varying. You know, it hasn't got a set gear, which is great for economy. Ha! That's another thing I've got to point out. Aside from all the other features, such as a CD player and electric windows and power steering, it also has 
some of the best economy I've ever had in a car. It's got 563.7 k's out of one tank in city driving, which is not too bad for an econo box. Now the trick is, figure out how much gas I've actually burned doing those 563.7 kilometers. And if I can get to the gas station, I'll fill up the car and do some maths. If I can get to the gas station. You do sort of have to ask, why would anyone have a high performance car in Auckland City? Because this is what you spend most of your time doing, sitting or crawling. And now I must go and hand over a large amount of money to an oil company. For some reason, it's underneath the parking brake. Let's go fill her up. Uh, electric car drivers do not miss this sort of stuff. Not too bad as far as gas cars in New Zealand go. Nice. Dropping gas everywhere. So I did the math and that is 3.9 litres per 100 k's, which is about 60 miles per gallon. All in a car with air conditioning and power steering and a roof for when it rains. I mean, that is pretty good. That is the same as a Toyota Prius or a Ionic Hybrid. That's pretty good for four and a half grand. Now, I've had a lot of different cars, all different sizes, six cylinders, V8s, four cylinders, three cylinders, electric, couple of electric cars, but I really do like three cylinder engine cars. They're brilliant. Oh crap, here is the infamous Royal Oak roundabout. Uh, so I'm gonna need all the power I've got. I'm gonna put it into B, whatever that one does. Because as you can see, roundabouts are really common in New Zealand, and ones like this, you need to be on the ball. No, he's going straight. Uh, surprisingly, not a lot of accidents at this roundabout. Even though, you know, it's got all the ingredients you need for daily crashes. People just, you know, you know, we make roundabouts work, and I am out of luck. No one's giving me space. So here we go, here's my chance. Foot down, and we're off. Arrgh, foot hard down. Chaos everywhere. All right. Now when this car does actually get up to speed, and it's got all the specs, it also has a thing, ah, the dashboard light has just come on, called Eco Idle. Now this is nothing new in modern cars, but for a 2012 car like this, with a constantly variable, Tesla, constantly variable transmission, Eco Idle means that if I pull over here, you watch this, pull over, once I get below 7 kilometers an hour, stops. Now that is pretty cool. Not only that, I want to show you this really cool th function here. See the dashboard? On the left hand side there is a counter in milliliters of how much fuel I haven't burned. Now obviously everything's in Japanese because this is a Japanese domestic market car. And on the right hand side is a timer. Now every time you start the car and start a new journey, whenever it goes into... Oh, okay. So there we go. It needs to keep the air conditioning going so the engine started again. Whenever you go on a, uh, a journey, it will count how many seconds or minutes your car has been idling. Sometimes I've spent, you know, I've gone for a couple of hours through Auckland City, I've, I've, been, I've, I've been idling, or not idling, been resting the engine for like eight, nine minutes. Uh, now that's the fuel counter, which shows it's, it's do doing currently 19.5 kilometers per liter, which is pretty bad because I've got the air conditioning going and I'm driving aggressively. Uh, but uh, the best I've got so far is 27.5 litres per 100k, which I think is around 60 miles per gallon. This is an interesting car. I think it's an interesting car, but this is not my last car. Uh, I'll be honest, I just bought this car when I came back to New Zealand a few weeks ago, uh, and I needed a set of wheels. Turns out I've been offered a job that pays more than I earned in the United States, quite a bit more, uh, and it's doing something I love, video creation on new tech, test driving all the latest electric cars as they come into the country. Obviously much higher production value than this crappy little five minute video I threw together. But also I'll be given a company car. It will be a company electric car. Watch this space. But things are going to get really awesome. I don't know, I felt like, you know, my wife asked for a divorce and I, I was distraught and you know when you get to a certain age, 
like my age, I'm halfway to 82 right now, and you are through two failed marriages, and you're unemployed and no prospects, and you sort of ask yourself, well, okay, well, hmm, yeah. Then everything's, uh, everything's just sort of I've fallen into a big vat of bubbling, boiling feces, and I have come out crystal clean, smelling like roses. I, oh, it's a miracle. Anyway, watch this space. Things are going to get really interesting. I'm excited. I'm really excited. You can tell, I'm animated. I'm speaking like I've had three lines of cocaine. Obviously, I haven't. Don't take drugs. But yeah, actually, I'm going to the supermarket now, because I need to go buy a bottle of celebratory champagne. See you soon.